This video is sponsored by Whatnot. Sign up with my link for a free $15 credit and make sure to bookmark our upcoming giveaway stream on March 2nd. Stick around till the end of the video for more details. Hey guys, Nintendo here. It's no secret the Nintendo 64 is one of my favorite game systems of all time. So much so that I collected one of every title that was launched in North America, one of each of the fantastic color variants, and countless collectibles from the era. But even I don't know everything about this guy. For today's video, I have scoured the internet to compile a list of some of the most interesting and surprising facts I could find surrounding Nintendo's legendary 64-bit console. So let's get to it. Starting off at fact number one, the Expansion Pack's Fatal Flaw. The Nintendo 64 Expansion Pack significantly expanded the N64's capabilities by replacing the standard jumper pack and increasing the console's onboard memory from a paltry 4 megabytes to an astounding 8 megabytes. All jokes aside, while the Expansion Pack wasn't required except by a handful of specific titles, it brought with it optional benefits like higher resolutions, more detailed textures, and better frame rates to many other games in the system's library. But where other titles saw levels of improvement to varying degrees, one title in particular was rendered nearly unplayable by the add-on. Space Station Silicon Valley is a 3D platformer developed by DMA Design, in which players possess and take control over robotic animals in order to take down their enemies and solve various puzzles. DMA Design, of course, is the team that eventually became known as Rockstar North, and is responsible for developing most of the titles in the GTA series. Eager gamers attempting to play Space Station Silicon Valley with an expansion pack in tow would often be met with frequent system crashes, especially during the adventure's cutscenes. The general consensus seems to be that the way the game's code accessed data from RAM highlighted an incompatibility with the otherwise helpful accessory. Thankfully, in this case, it seems that this issue was fixed with a later cartridge revision. If you happen to have a copy, take a moment and look at the back label of your cartridge. You should be able to find an embossed batch number on the top right corner. If you see some numbers followed by the letter A, you've got the first revision cartridge and shouldn't have any issues with this bug. But if you only see numbers, you've likely got a launch cartridge, so you might want to hang on to that original jumper pack. Fact number two. The N64's region lock was surprisingly simple. If you're at all familiar with the 64's region protection, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, just like the Super Nintendo before it, the design Nintendo chose to implement for this system's regional restrictions was incredibly simple, and consequently quite simple to bypass. Take a look at these two photos. Which cartridge seems like the correct shape to you? Well, as it turns out, the answer depends on where you're from. These are both authentic N64 cartridges, but the one on the left is from the US, and the one on the right is the cartridge shape you might see in Japan or PAL regions like the UK and Australia. That's right, Nintendo's analog approach to region control was nothing more than two small plastic tabs that physically prevent a mismatched cartridge from connecting with the cartridge slot. But conveniently, that also meant that resourceful gaming enthusiasts could just remove the back half of any working donor cartridge and swap that in for an import game's back shell. Unfortunately, PAL games are a different beast entirely, due to that wacky 50Hz refresh rate they have across the pond. But if you've got a North American system with a Japanese game, or a Japanese system with an American game, you're in luck. In fact, for a more permanent solution, you can replace the cartridge tray itself with one that doesn't have those lockout tabs at all. Or you can even take a rotary tool to them and cut away those tabs permanently to make your very own almost region-free system. If you're at all interested in that process, I've actually got a DIY tutorial on the channel for how to do this yourself, and I'll leave a link to that video in the description below. Next up at fact number three, the N64 has some fascinating regional variants. Now don't get me wrong, here in the States, we got a beautiful array of Nintendo 64 systems. On top of the six vibrant colors of the Fantastic series, we also got a limited edition gold console as a Toys R Us exclusive, and of course, who could forget this super cute Pikachu model. But other territories had their own interesting and exclusive designs for the console as well. Japan in particular saw a number of really cool two-toned designs with matching controllers that collectors tend to be fond of. But for the truly weird ones, we'll have to dig a bit deeper. Maybe all the way to China? You might have heard of the IQ Player, which was a plug-and-play in 64 contained entirely within this chunky controller body. At the time of its release, China was operating under a strict nationwide ban of traditional game systems, so Nintendo devised a plan to work with a local entrepreneur to release this plug-and-play version of the hardware. By eliminating the need for cartridges by allowing players to download new titles onto a rewritable memory card, Nintendo was able to take advantage of a loophole in the local legislation. But here's another interesting variant that I just recently learned of myself. The Hyundai Comboy 64. Yeah, Hyundai, like the car company. 
Similarly to the IQ player, the Convoy 64 was created to circumvent a local law. In this case, a trade embargo levied against Japan that was in effect at the time in South Korea. So Nintendo approached Hyundai and got them on board to distribute it instead. But in this case, the only major differences from the 64 we all know and love are the inclusion of some Korean language labels and the Convoy 64 logo printed on the jumper pack cover. Fact number four. The tech that powered the N64 was almost sold to Sega instead. In the early 1990s, Silicon Graphics Inc. founder Jim Clark was on the hunt for an established game industry partner. His intent was to strike a deal to supply the next generation of game consoles with cutting-edge real-time graphics, courtesy of the MIPS R4000 microprocessor. As the story goes, Clark first approached the 3DO company with his product, but was promptly turned away. His second choice of collaborator was Sega of America, so he approached them next with the tech that would ultimately power the N64. It's believed that if the deal went through, the MIPS processor would have been used as the basis for the Sega Saturn, but after some deliberation, Sega of Japan vetoed the deal. Apparently not one to be discouraged, he finally brought it to Nintendo, and the rest is history. While the N64 was ultimately outpaced in raw sales figures by the Sony PlayStation, the Sega Saturn absolutely languished in third place, contributing to a trend which ultimately led Sega to drop out of the console wars and become a third-party publisher. And finally, fact number five, the Nintendo 64's arcade counterpart. If you're as deep into Nintendo lore as I am, you've probably heard of the Triforce arcade system. As a collaboration between Nintendo, Sega, and Namco, the Triforce board was built on a modified version of the GameCube's architecture, and was the basis for such titles as Mario Kart Arcade GP, F-Zero AX, Virtua Striker 2002, and even an unreleased prototype for Star Fox Assault. But of course, this wasn't Nintendo's first crack at taking over the arcade. In years prior, Nintendo partnered with SATA Corporation to develop the Alex 64. The Alex 64 was a bare-bones arcade board exclusively distributed in Japan, which could play a unique library of original and ported N64 titles. Apparently, it could be installed in one of these Astro City-style cabinets from Sega. As far as I was able to find, there are 11 known titles that were released for this platform, plus one prototype, including two standard N64 releases, a handful of Mahjong and Shogi games, a couple of action titles, a racing game, a soccer game, and even an erotic puzzle game. Questionable content aside, most of these games can even run on a standard Nintendo 64 by method of flash cartridge after a quick patch for compatibility. Alright, I think that's going to do it for today. Thank you all so much for watching this video on weird Nintendo 64 facts. I hope you enjoyed. Hold on just a dang moment. Future Drew here with a special announcement. This weekend on March 2nd at 2 p.m. Eastern, we're doing another giveaway live stream over on Whatnot. For those who don't know, Whatnot is a combination live streaming and shopping app where you can bid on items and view the exact items that you're bidding on in real time. Kind of like Twitch meets eBay. But of course, you won't have to spend anything on my stream because we're going to be giving away lots of cool stuff absolutely free. And even if you don't win anything, you'll still get a free $15 credit for use on my channel or anybody else's just for signing up. Here's how to get that credit. Follow my link in the pinned comment below to sign up for an account and download the Whatnot app. Once it's installed, head over to the search bar and type in Nintendrew, and you should see my channel pop up. Drop me a follow while you're here, then click on the Shows tab to bookmark the upcoming giveaway. That way you'll be notified when we go live. Thanks again to Whatnot for sponsoring this episode, and I hope to see you all over there on Saturday. As always, if you did like the video, please do consider subscribing to Nintendrew for all sorts of cool gaming content, and make sure to share it with any friends who might find it interesting. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Bye!